Welcome to this evening's program, Museum Moment in Kansas City, 1926 to 1940. My name is Amelia Nelson, Director of the Library and Archives here at the Nelson Atkins. Before we begin this evening's program, I have some quick housekeeping. This program has captioning enabled if you would like to use this feature. Tonight's program will end with time for questions. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions um, you have throughout this evening's program. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Julian Zuguzgoitia, the Minifee D, and Mary Louise Blackwell, Director and CEO here at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, to introduce this evening's program. Hello, everyone, and I hope you are having a wonderful evening, and I think you are in for a treat about the stories uh, behind a very interesting time here in Kansas City in which three great institutions came to be. And it is also a special moment in which we have also the Kansas City Museum reopening. So it's just a fabulous time to have this conversation. It is of course based and, and, and supports the exhibition that uh, is currently on view at the Nelson Atkins called Origins, Collecting to Create the Nelson Atkins. So it explores the founding elements that brought our collections to be, who were the trustees behind these ideas, where, who were the, the early consultants, early directors, early uh, messengers that we had all around the globe helping us uh, create our, our, first, uh, our first collections. And also, I think it brings into mind what it is and what it was at that time to think of an encyclopedic museum. That's the name of the kind of museums that we are. We are an art encyclopedic museum in which the idea is, the goal is to have representations of all the arts of the world, the best inspiration of all around the world. So think of it, when we've been created, travel was not what it is today. It was very difficult, very rarely people could travel across the Atlantic. And it is still today difficult, but um, the idea was to bring the world to us and to Kansas City. And in many ways, our founders and first directors and first uh, associate curators and directors exceeded that. But Kansas City at the time in, in, in the 30s, uh, you have to imagine that the Liberty Memorial opened in 1926. So what a great also jolt of energy and look at everyone coming to, to see uh, the memorial, it was definitely a gathering place as it is today, a place of memory and a place of celebration and a place of contemplation. And then of course, shortly thereafter, the Kansas City Museum in 1940. And it is also great that it is, has been redeveloped and it is opening their doors. They opened last week, I think, and it is just creating a great sense of re-energizing the city in all its possibilities. So a world war history, history of Kansas City, global art history, all of this makes the Kansas City the great city we are. And today to discuss all this and to moderate, it is my pleasure to introduce John Heron, who will be moderating and, and, and discussing this program. As you all know, John Heron is the director and CEO of the Kansas City Public Library, where he heads a great team of people to build award-winning public programs. He invests also in digital scholarship and also supports Kansas City community with important social services. So prior to leading Kansas City Public Library, uh, we all knew John in his prior uh, role as interim Dean of the College of Arts and Science at UMKC, where he also is a specialist in 19th century American social and history with research interests that include environmental history, the American West and regional studies. And we got to know each other for, for many, many reasons, uh, among others, spending some New Year's Eve together, but more importantly, because he also devoted a lot of time to interviewing one of our great patrons, Henry Block, and creating a wonderful narrative of his life, a book that I highly recommend called Navigating a Life on Henry Block. So with no further ado, uh, let's uh, have John put his wonderful camera on, and now you see him. And with that, welcome, John. All right, th thank you. And thank you very much, Julian. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, this, uh, this period in American life, this period you know, in American history between the two world wars is a collection of amazing contrasts. For example, census records from the early century um, 
uh, excuse me, I'm having a little bit of a problem with my computer. Census records from the early century were celebrated with great fanfare as they seem to prove that finally, more than half of all Americans now lived in urban centers. This was deemed the age of the great city. But urban in this period was defined as no more than a few thousand people. And to point out the obvious, it was only still half, which meant that the other equal portion continued to live on farms and isolated areas. At the same time, immigrants poured into this region from around the globe. They poured onto America's shores, providing the much needed labor to drive an industrializing machine. These diverse arrivals gave the country a kind of rolling dynamic energy that became a unique hallmark of American life. Yet at the same time, we witnessed a peak in anti-radical hysteria that targeted these newest arrivals to our continent. Congress passed quotas on the number of, of immigrants welcome here and restrictive associations sprung up from coast to coast. We could keep this exercise going for quite some time. We have prohibition and yet the development of an underground culture of, of, of vice and, and, uh, and liquor. We have a fundamentalist revival in faith and yet we also have an accompanying explosion in evolution and scientific reason. Lighthearted activities like flagpole sitting contests and goldfish eating competitions were all the rage. And yet they shared headline space with more serious news about economic collapse and recovery. Jazz and flappers paired with constriction and conservatism. Women's suffrage and expanding opportunity for African-Americans rose in tandem with racism. Well, historians like myself will tell you that every age has dualities. The world is after all a complex place. But this period in American life, this period that we're talking about this evening, the opening decades of the 20th century, it does seem special as what kind of republic we wish to build or what we hope to become seemed open for public debate. Well, Kansas City as a unique place was not exempt from this same kind of back and forth. A frontier town that shared much in common with places like Dodge City or Abilene, Kansas City was in many ways a Western community. And yet the best evidence of this influence, the stockyards, were a major industry, indeed just as industrial as the activities of Pittsburgh or, or Detroit. And with many residents in this city that could trace their heritage to places like Kentucky and Tennessee and, and Virginia, it was perhaps more of a Southern city in manners and customs and habits anyway. Kansas, Kansas City rightfully prided itself on progressivism, yet it was run by one of the most effective and by effective, I mean corrupt political machines in America. So just like for the rest of the nation, for Kansas City, this list goes on of all of these sort of competing influences and forces that help define the city's character. At the crossroads of American transportation networks and cultural norms, Kansas City in this period typified the broad trends in American history. The decades bounded by the world wars were marked by intense political, social, and economic change as the United States reluctantly took its place on the world stage while simultaneously struggling with significant challenges at home. But let's think about using this setup not as evidence of a city that's unable to figure out what it wants to become when it grows up, which is a great conversation that we'll save for another time, because in many important ways, how Kansas City responded to the challenges of the 20th century can tell us a great deal about the coming of a fully modern America. Because just as the nation was engaged in a redefinition of the country's character, Kansas City adjusted to change in ways that illuminated how the, how the, I don't know, how this community navigated this important period of transition. This region, as we all know, was and in many ways remains today a city divided by the hard lines of race and class. But in this period, it was also a city of possibilities, where the restrictions that govern life in a segregated state were often more fluid. And in a city that sometimes struggled to understand its own importance in national narratives, how residents of this community engaged in the conversation about the costs and consequences of growth can reveal a great deal about American culture. 
Well, there are many different ways in which we could frame this story to anchor it in this specific moment in time. Our focus tonight could be on politics and the city's role in the creation of the modern Democratic Party. Or we could look to the influential and still controversial J.C. Nichols and the foundations of American suburbia. We could look to specific institutions like the construction of the Federal Reserve Bank, 1921, that impacted the national finance system. Or we could look to specific events like the Republican National Convention that was in Kansas City in 1928. It put this community on a national stage. All of this could work because in truth, this was an undeniably heady time. And Kansas City's booster machine had been gathering steam for quite some time. Writing um, in the very first decade of the, of the 20th century, um, a local historian by the name of Kerry Westlake Whitney called this period, the, the simply the logic of destiny is that Kansas City is to be the greatest metropolis on the American continent. I mean, come on, we have to applaud such, such bravado and such confidence. And while an overstatement to be sure, her comments illustrated an ambition that many people shared about this city in this time. We can set aside boosterism for just a little bit because Kansas City in this age did not just take on the signifiers of a modern metropolis, it became a city of national note, easily one of the top 20 cities in America. As we see in this image, a new downtown skyline emerged with 20 and 30 story office towers, road and apartment construction surged, neighborhoods expanded. In 1927, the municipal airport opened, the Kansas City Art Institute moved to its current headquarters. Two years later, my previous employer, the University of Kansas City, was founded as was the Kansas City Philharmonic at the exact same time. Voters approved a massive bond issue, the so-called 10-year uh, plan, for the city's continuing development. Projects that emerged from that included municipal auditorium, um, a civic center featuring, featuring skyscraper city hall and county courthouse buildings, sports and convention facilities, parks, playgrounds, schools, hospitals, and a zoo. And in this town, we would be remiss if we didn't mention other hallmark cultural achievements of the day, like the explosion of jazz, right? Charlie Parker was born in Kansas City in 1920, or barbecue. Henry Perry's famous stand at 18th and Vine became a metro-wide sensation all right now. Well, all of this activity, all of this action, um, in many ways sets the stage for what we're gonna talk about this evening. How does a city mature? What should it look like when it does? What kinds of institutions do we build? And what message does that send, not only to the residents of this community, but to the, to the nation as well? And since we are reflecting on museums, what does it mean to memorialize the past in the still developing city? How do we, or perhaps how should we, talk about history and memory and culture and remembrance? Of course, just as important as all of these questions is the timing. Why now? In a city that has, what, uh, more than a 200 year history, why this burst of activity in the early 20th century? Well, residents of this region did not look to a growing population as evidences of their city's health or well being, nor perhaps should they, as since when is an accidental collection of people formation of a true community? Rather, in this period, it was understood that cities needed to actively plan for the physical and moral well being of their citizens, who could, in return, contribute to the welfare of the city. Well, some of this was about economic development, as it was understood that when we uplift city culture, we also stabilize property values. But this is more than a discussion about economic growth, as the development of cultural institutions was taken as evidence of a city on the move. Kansas City's parks and boulevards, our statues, and of course, our fountains are well known. But it was at this moment in the city's history that community leaders became convinced that museums were not just a luxury, but were required for proper development. Well, helping us explore this topic tonight are representatives of three of the anchoring cultural institutions that have their origins in the intellectual ferment of this period. 
First is Jonathan Casey, Director of Archives and the Edward Jones Research Center at the National World War I Museum and Memorial. Jonathan has been with the museum for more than two decades, helping people learn about the Great War and what the museum's vast archival and library collections have to offer. Next will be Denise Morrison, Director of Collections and Curatorial Affairs at the Kansas City Museum. She has been with the museum since 1988, serving in a wide variety of roles that includes archivist, registrar, collections manager, and now Director of Collections. Our final speaker is Tara Laver, Senior Archivist at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. Tara has been the museum's archivist since 2017 and is the co-creator of the current exhibit, Origins, that, that Julian mentioned in the opening. Before joining the Nelson, she had a long career at the Louisiana State University Library Special Collections, primary as the, primarily as the curator of manuscripts uh, for the Louisiana and Lower Mississippi Valley Collections. Well, thanks to each of you for joining our, our discussion. Jonathan, I will turn the, the microphone over to you to introduce us to the, to the World War I Mu Museum. Uh, thank you, John. And uh, good evening, everybody out there somewhere uh, this evening. Um, so I have five minutes, roughly, to um, present my uh, story about the National World War I Museum and Memorial. Uh, so to begin with, basically, World War I ended in the Liberty Memorial, which later became the National Museum and Memorial, started. Uh, and we're talking about right at the end of the war, uh, November 1918, even a few days before the armistice of November 11th. Uh, there was an editorial in, editorial in one of the Kansas City papers uh, saying that uh, Kansas City should get together and, um, and honor those who served, especially those who sacrificed uh, their lives and who gave everything for the cause. Uh, and so this um, uh, people gathered early on in that month in November and in December, there were all the civic and business leaders uh, gathered and said uh, that something should be done in Kansas City. And they knew that uh, other cities would be creating memorials and uh, uh, doing the same thing. So they wanted, Kansas City kind of wanted to get ahead of the game. And that's a kind of a question we get all the time is why is the National Museum and Memorial in Kansas City and not in Washington, DC? And then that's a big involved question, but uh, it's just that the people in Kansas City uh, just got organized early and wanted and uh, just wanted to do something big to, to recognize those who served and remember those who, um, who lost their lives uh, in the war. Um, and what we're looking at here on the screen is a uh, poster from uh, uh, 1919 period, uh, Lest the Ages Forget. That was a common slogan, Lest the Ages Forget. Uh, and it talks, it, it uh, 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 mentions the Liberty War Memorial and so cemetery and so forth in some a combat scene. Uh, and then uh, um, um, uh, uh, talks about the uh, Kansas City's 400 boys who gave their lives in the World War. Uh, there's 400 and boys, as they say, and one girl actually, uh, uh, her name is Loretta Hollenbach. She was a nurse uh, and um, died. She was serving stateside and died from influenza. Uh, so what, we, what you can see today uh, in the uh, East Building Memory Hall of the complex is uh, uh, plaques on the, on the west wall of that building uh, that have the 441 names of Kansas City Missourians who did die in service or were killed in service. Uh, as Kansas City was much smaller then, uh, so it was just within the corporate limits uh, of those, uh, those names. So there's 441 with their names and, and military information. And um, uh, it's, it's very uh, impressive to see and, and uh, to uh, remember those who served. Um, so the campaign started uh, in 1919 after the after uh, the Liberty Moral Association was formed, and the fundraising went into effect in 1919, uh, and it raised um, two million dollars toward the construction of a future memorial and and museum. It was voted on by people to have a memorial and museum, so that's why we have a museum today. It's not just a memorial structure, but it's also a living structure of history and memory um, with us today. And uh, $2 million was raised and about a half, half million dollars was raised for other causes called allied charities for other things to um, uh, that uh, activities that went on during the war and to help um, um, pay off some of the debt for those activities. So um, two million, two and a half million. And eventually then there was a uh, competition, architectural competition and, and everything and things started to move forward. Um, and, um, and if we can go to the next slide. 
uh, want to show you. This is um, this has happened a hundred years ago, just a few two weeks ago, two to three weeks ago, November first, nineteen twenty-one. This is a photograph uh, of the site dedication, and you're looking at the hillside of what is Memorial Hill. Looking, you're looking uh, east, and then across that. Uh, area with a mass of people, 100,000 people or so attended this ceremony, and it was the largest attendance in Kansas City history up to that time. Uh, that's Union Station on the left. Uh, there you see a podium in the center. It was erected. Um, that's where all the speeches were done, and this was before the use of microphones or anything, so this was all kind of shouted out. Uh, the, but the five allied commanders, um, the Supreme Commanders, including General uh, John Pershing, who was from Laclede, Missouri, who was the American Expeditionary Forces Commander in Chief, uh, Marshal Foch and uh, General Diaz, Marshal Foch of France, General Diaz of Italy, uh, Admiral Beatty of Great Britain, and uh, Lieutenant General uh, Jacques of Belgium all met here. Uh, the they were they were all together at this this place. This, this was the first time that they were together. Uh, the foreign generals uh, were in the country to. Um, Go to eventually to go to Arlington National Cemetery to dedicate the tomb of the unknown soldier. And that would be November 11th of 1921. So this event was October uh, was November 1st. It was during the third annual American Legion Convention. The American Legion Veterans Organization was formed at the end of uh, World War One uh, in France, and uh, uh, and this was the third convention going on. And these dignitaries were invited uh, to this event. And so that's our site dedication again, uh, obviously this year, 100th anniversary on November 1st. Um, and uh, the I will mention that the sitting vice president at the time, Calvin Coolidge was here um, and as one of the honorees, uh, one of the dignitaries. And um, uh, we had we did invite Kamala Harris actually uh, this year for um, Veterans Day for Armistice Day ceremony, ceremony but she had uh, made other plans, was in Paris. Uh, so uh, anyway, um, as I said, the largest crowd up to that date um, in Kansas City and a, a, obviously a huge event uh, in the city's history. We can uh, go on to the next slide, please. Um, this is uh, this photograph is kind of similar to one that was in the introduction uh, slide that uh, when Julian was talking uh, about us. This is 1926. So uh, and, uh, this brings us up to um, the sort of the beginning then of the um, period of with the exhibition at the Nelson Atkins. Uh, 1926, so this would be five years in the future, then will be another centennial for us and for the city. Uh, November 11, 1926, uh, this is the dedication of the structure itself of the Memorial Museum. Uh, Calvin Coolidge was back as president then. He was the sitting president, the last sitting president to visit the site. Uh, and you can uh, see this is kind of a closer shot, a ground shot looking down the mall. So you're looking north toward the tower, the observation tower, uh, and uh, looking at kind of see the podium there kind of uh, the, with the curtains around it at the base of the tower. And, and then uh, at that point, there were microphones, so they didn't have to shout so much, but um, uh, Coolidge and all had microphones. Uh, we have the lectern that he used for that ceremony in our collection. Uh, so the, you see the buildings flanking the tower on the on the right side. The east side is Memory Hall, and I mentioned that's the, where the plaques of the uh, called the We Are the Dead plaques of the 441 names. On the uh, left side, the west side is uh, is uh, the exhibit hall. That was the original museum space, and uh, there was a whole uh, campaign to gather artifacts uh, for the uh, exhibit space, and the, a, a number of the artifacts were donated by foreign countries. Uh, and those are some of those are on exhibit today in the main gallery uh, space. And so, um, as it was planned, had memorial museum. Uh, the grounds here are not finished. There was still a lot of work to be done on the landscaping uh, around the grounds, and still a lot of what you would see today when you come here. If you were to look at it from Union Station, look south, and you would see the sculptural frieze wall that's on the north side, and all that. That wasn't done until the 30s, uh, and some of the other things that were. Um, done later on. Uh, so uh, this was, again, this is um, the, our opening in 1926. And again, a, another large crowd, in fact, even a bigger crowd, I think uh, 150,000 attended this um, ceremony. Uh, and, um, you know, again, a huge, uh, uh, important event uh, important in Kansas City's history. And now what we have today, I mean, it came from that. And um, the museum has had some tough times, but it's um, uh, really a world-class museum here in Kansas City. 
uh, with a world-class collection. And um, um, it's just something that uh, is obviously is, is seen as significant uh, by the city and, and by the country and, and around the world. Um, and that is pretty much, that's my uh, presentation. Um, so I, I want to now uh, turn it over to uh, Denise Morrison, with the Kansas City Museum. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. I'm going to try to attempt to get through a rather complicated story on the history of the Kansas City Museum. It really begins with the end of an era. You'll see on the left there the portrait of Robert A. Long. Long was a longtime businessman. He'd been in the city since 1895. He co-founded and owned the Long Bell Lumber Company at this time that he built Corinthian Hall, his estate. He, his company was one of the largest in the country. And he built Corinthian Hall to, in effect, uh, have an estate that befit that, that level of, uh, of his, his prowess, I suppose, as a businessman was a philanthropist. He was the first president of the Liberty Memorial Association. And uh, his estate, Corinthian Hall, was built in the Northeast neighborhood of Kansas City, Missouri. And it was a three acre estate, full city block, right on the edge of North Terrace Park and Cliff Drive. Mr. Long died March 15th, 1934, and left his heirs, his two daughters, Sally and Lula, with this massive estate in the midst of the Great Depression. After a two day massive auction in which most of the contents of the home and of several of the buildings uh, was auctioned off, the home was then, as you can see on the right, put up for sale. But the daughters uh, included and involved a woman named Olive Hoggins, who's been credited with helping bring a lot of movers and shakers together. Um, she was hired to be the caretaker of the estate. She was also a bit of a tour guide. She would give tours of the empty mansion uh, for various people. And she was what we would call today someone who thought outside the box. She realized, as many people did, that Corinthian Hall was not in the current economic situation going to possibly ever be a single family residence again. So she began to look outside at what other organizations were looking for, potentially new homes, businesses, and there were those out there. At this time, there were a few organizations that had been collecting historical material and just simply did not have a place for those materials, one of which was the Missouri Valley Historical Society, um, a historical society that had been around since before the turn of the century. They'd amassed a good size, 30, 40,000 object according to the museum's first director, collection of historical objects and archeological material. But this was an organization that never had a permanent home. They were always looking uh, uh, dependent upon the kindness of uh, other businesses and organizations that would give them space to display. And at the time of Mr. Long's death in 1934, they in fact had mothballed their collection. They were not an organization that had recruited a lot of new members and they were in fact uh, a dying breed, so to speak. Another organization that was looking a bit for help was the Board of Education who had been gifted a collection of Native American, what was known as Daniel Dyer's Indian collection of Indian curios. This collection had been gifted to them by Daniel Dyer uh, as a gift to the children, school children of Kansas City, but obviously the Board of Education wasn't in a position to display these pieces and had turned to the Kansas City Public Library for help. The library at Ninth and Locust boasted not only an art gallery, but a museum gallery. 
and there's there is where the Dyer collection would reside for many years. The library was also accepting donations of historical items themselves, <laughs> and so they amassed quite a collection on their own, which they would eventually call the Dyer Museum. It was in addition to the Dyer collection, again, historical objects, archeological anthropological objects. And again, by the time of Mr. Long's death in the 1934, mid 1930s, the collections had been on display all through the twenties. They were looking a little old and sad there didn't seem to be a future for where these collections could find, find a final home. And it was with that in mind that Olive Hoggins was able to bring these, these organizations together, <coughs> excuse me. And in spring of 1939, a group got together and formed the Kansas City Museum Association. Olive Hoggins then put that association together with the Long Heirs, Sally Long Ellis and Lula Long Combs. And in May of 1939, the two daughters gifted the association, the estate of Ari Long, all three acres, the entire city block. And at that point, the association then needed to find a way to bring all these collections together and to refurbish that building. Next slide, please. So who was gonna put all this together? Who was gonna organize and bring order out of all this chaos? Well, if you look at that young handsome man on the right who is peering uh, pensively at the bison, that is a man named John Ripley Forbes, and he was a young man in his early 20s who had, was from Boston, Massachusetts. He had read an article in the Reader's Digest about a new potential museum coming to Kansas City, Missouri, and without even so much as sending a telegram saying, I'm coming, he jumped in his car, drove to Kansas City, and presented himself to the board uh, and said, basically, you don't have to pay me until you feel that I've earned my worth, but I will work to get your museum open. And the board said, uh, sure. So uh, he immediately got to work in the summer of 1939. He, the first thing he did was to go to the local WPA office, Works Progress Administration, and ask for workers. And he got 60, he got artists, he got carpenters, he got technicians, he got painters, he got textile workers, he got clerical workers. And together they rehabilitated Corinthian Hall, which had been empty for six years. They painted walls. They turned the entire first floor into museum gallery space. They inventoried and organized the collection pieces from Missouri Valley Historical Society and the public library. They did not get the Dyer Museum collection uh, for a while, so they did not open with that collection. There was some uh, litigation still going on with that. But by May of 1930, 1940, sorry, May of 1940, they were ready on May 5th, 1940, uh, John Ripley Forbes recorded for posterity that the Kansas City Museum opened from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. with a visitation of 4,500 people. And on the left, you can see the opening doors and uh, all the people who are ready to come in to see the, the museum. And I know I've probably talked way longer than I should have. So the third slide if you'll show, we'll just show uh, uh, the growth, the expansion of the Kansas City Museum. It always tried to uphold both history and sci the science fields. It would be the co-founder and first host of the science fair in Kansas City. It opened the city's first planetarium. And I would be totally remiss if I did not mention 
the upcoming anniversary, November 21st, 1954, the opening of Eskimo Land and the museum still number one exhibit the crawl in igloo. And that's where I will end on the uh, history of the Kansas City Museum. I'm going to turn it over now uh, to Tara Laver, who's going to talk about the beginnings of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. Thanks, Denise. Um, so thank you all for being here tonight. I'm excited to have, have the audience to talk about um, some more about the early history of the museum. Um, so over 20 years in the making, the William Raquel Nelson Gallery of Art and Mary Atkins Museum of Fine Arts opened its doors to the public for the first time in December of 1933. It was the realization of the dreams of William Raquel Nelson and Mary McAfee Atkins, both of whom envisioned a world-class art museum in Kansas City as a means of enhancing the cultural life of their adopted hometown. Next slide, please. When Mary Atkins died in 1911, Kansas Cityans were somewhat stunned to learn the extent of her fortune and that she had left $300,000, quote, for the purchase of the necessary ground in Kansas City, Missouri, and the erection of a building to be maintained and used as a museum of fine arts for the use and benefit of the public. Atkins, a retired school teacher from Kentucky, had come to Kansas City after marrying her childhood friend, James Burris Atkins, who had made his fortune in Kansas City mills and real estate. After he died in 1886, she invested the sizable fortune he left her and it grew to almost $1 million at the time of her death. The story is that her many travels in Europe led her to, to de um, a deep appreciation for art um, and that in turn led to the bequest for the art museum. William Raquel Nelson died four years after Mary Atkins in 1915. A real estate developer, advocate for the City Beautiful movement, and founder and editor of the Kansas City Star, Nelson believed not only in the benefit of art for the public, but also in how an art museum would enhance Kansas City's status as a city. In his will, he called for a trust to be established from his estate after the deaths of his wife and daughter, the income from which would be used, quote, for the purchase of works and reproductions of works of fine arts which will contribute to the delectation and enjoyment of the public, end quote. So just to emphasize, his money was to be used for the purchase of art, not a building. But then um, his widow, Ida, and daughter, Laura Nelson Kirkwood, built on this legacy, including provisions in their wills to fund the construction of a museum to provide a home for that collection. The two women passed away within just 11 years of William Rockhill Nelson, and with Laura's death, the William Raquel Nelson Trust was appointed. Those first trustees were businessman and philanthropist William Volker, real estate developer J.C. Nichols, and realtor Herbert Jones. Laura's husband, Erwin Kirkwood, uh, further contributed with additional funds, as well as the Oak Hall site for the Nelson Gallery to be built on, and he died in 1927. In the meantime, the executors of Mary Atkins Trust had been drawing up plans for the Atkins Museum. They found that even though her bequest had grown from the $300,000 in 1911 to 700,000 by 1927, it still was insufficient to build an art museum. So they decided to join forces with the administrators of the estates of the various Nelson family estates. Um, and there was a common um, a, um, trustee between them, Herbert Jones, who was there um, as a somewhat younger man than he would have been at the time this was happening at the bottom of that stack of uh, the three trustees. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, Nelson's trust was to purchase the art, not the building that came from Mary Atkins Estate, Ida, Laura, and Erwin Kirkwood, as well as Frank Roselle, who had been the Nelson family attorney. Their trustees are shown here breaking ground on July 16, 1930. Earlier that year, William Raquel Nelson's trustees had started purchasing the art, but they were businessmen who knew little about art, and museum experts they consulted advised them to hire advisors or agents to help them determine what kind of art to acquire for the new museum and where to find it. So the trustees employed several agents, each who had unique expertise and opinions, to advise on what should be acquired. These agents traveled the globe in search of art and they're pictured there, Harold Woodbury Parsons 
Langdon Warner, and Lawrence Sickman. And again, of course, you can learn more about them and the development of the early collection in the exhibition Origins, Collecting to Create the Nelson Atkins that's on display until March 6th. Um, as this photograph shows on the right, by February 1931, the building was well on its way to completion. Next slide, please. As the art came in and the museum went up, it all started to become a reality and the trustees needed someone to deal with it all. Looking at the minutes, their work on the museum was almost a full-time job in addition to their very busy day jobs. So in February of 1932, they hired Paul Gardner on the left there, who was then enrolled in a museum graduate program at Harvard. So they hired him as their assistant. He took charge of finishing the building, installing the collections and organizing the first programs. In September 1933, the trustees appointed him the first director, and he soon put together a small staff who joined him in preparing for the December opening. In expectation of the high interest in the opening, the trustees and Gardner settled on a slate of events to help distribute the crowds. First on the calendar was an invita invitation only VIP gala um, on Sunday, December 10th, and that had a crowd of 2000 people. But the main event opening to the public came on came the next day, December 11th, a Monday, um, and they had um, chosen to have it be a weekday, a work day, again, because they just expected to have so many people descend upon the museum. Um, so they're trying to somehow, you know, manage that crowd. So the 11th and 12th were uh, designated as the days for Kansas City, Missouri residents to attend. Um, and there were 8,000 people toured the museum between 10 o'clock and four o'clock when the formal dedication took place in Atkins Auditorium. To further manage the anticipated crowds, they designated each of the remaining days of that week for residents of Kansas City, Kansas, or the suburbs, and other days were specifically for children. Um, and finally, on Sunday, December 17th, which is when the photo at the right was taken, um, it was finally a day for the whole community to come, come one, come all. But widespread interest had not diminished by then. 11,000 visitors came between one and five, so just in four hours. They even had to stop um, admitting guests three times so that they could control the uh, crowds in the museum. And by the end of December 1933, an estimated 100,000 people had experienced the new Temple of Art in Kansas City. And we've been going ever since. So um, that gets us to opening and I will turn it over back to John so we can have a little bit of a discussion among us um, about what all this means. Yeah, thanks Tara. And thanks to uh, Denise and Jonathan as well. Just a quick reminder for any of the attendees, please put any of the questions you might have about these institutions into the chat and uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. So I want to ask a general question of the three of you. Um, now, we didn't mention too many names. Denise mentioned R.A. Long and, you know, we've got some prominent figures, but I think this, the story of these three cultural institutions is pretty interconnected. Is that the case? Like some of the same figures um, are, are influential in all three institutions. Was that the, was that the case? Yeah, feel free to jump in, any, anyone. Yeah, that's the case with R.A. Long. I mean, that for too well for uh, Liberty Memorial. He, uh, and Denise mentioned she was president of the Liberty Memorial Association and oversaw the fundraising and construction of it. And then, of course, his home came to the Kansas City Museum. So I don't know about a connection with Nelson Atkins. But, uh, well, I wonder, and I haven't been able, maybe Denise will know, but the contractor for the museum was... Um, John C. Long, I don't know if there's a connection with R.A. Long or not, but um, that, the two, the, you know, the last names are the same. Um, but I think, you know, also William Volker, who was one of our first trustees, was, um, I, I believe, on the committee um, for, the, for the Liberty Memorial. Um, I don't know if he had a connection with the Kansas City Museum or not. Um, but then, of course, um, J.C. Nichols, who was instrumental both in Liberty Memorial and then um, for the Nelson Atkins being um, 
an early trustee and becoming chair after Volcker and really had a, a big role to play in developing the early collection and getting the museum opened. I would say um, there's connections uh, with Mr. Long and JC Nichols. They worked mainly in terms of business wise in creating Longview, Washington. <laughs> Uh, they were they were business associates who worked closely. Uh, I don't think by the time the museum came into being that there was any connections there. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting because as I quickly breezed over in the opening, it's not just your three institutions, it's the Kansas City Philharmonic, it's the Art Institute, it's the University of Kansas City. And I think we've, you know, we've all mentioned some of them, J.C. Nichols, William Volker, Her, uh, Herb Jones, R.A. Long, William Dickey, um, George Kessler. It's a pretty tight group of individuals who are all seeking um, to transform the cultural landscape of Kansas City. In your understandings of the origins of each one of your institutions, did you get the sense that all of these people that we mentioned and more who are behind the, the startup of these groups, are they, and this is a very Kansas City question, are they coming, are they working out of pride to celebrate Kansas City or is there a little bit of defensiveness that, hey, we belong in this national conversation, we need to uplift Kansas City. Um, and maybe those are two sides of the same coin, but. Again, once again, anybody feel free to jump in. Yeah, I would well, say two, yeah, I'm sorry, two sides of the same coin. I mean, it was kind of both going together and all those people you mentioned, there's everyone with Liberty Memorial, every business and civic leader were a part of that thing. Um, from it started 1918 up to 1926, just everyone that I'm aware of having what I've read and what I know about Kansas City history at that time from all uh, all the walks of life, all the different industries and, and uh, it, uh, in the private sector and in the public sector. Anyway, everyone was involved, but I think it was, uh, I mean, it was what I said about with Liberty Memorial, it was a thing where um, the people who or got organized into the Liberty Memorial Association uh, wanted to do it as, as good or better than any other city like New York or Chicago. I mean, the big cities, and we kind of had a chip on our shoulder, I think. Um, and was just saying, well, we're going to outdo them and work harder and get, and get focused and start early and get this thing done. So that's from the Liberty Memorial point of view. It's funny you say that, John, about sort of the reference point of Chicago and New York, because um, I definitely get the sense um, at the museum that they always were sort of aware of the East Coast um, and the, the art. Um, you know, art scene and preponderance of, of museums on the East Coast and feeling like they sort of had something to prove um, by build, you know, this museum in Kansas City that it was that it was uh, on a par with with those. Um, but also it was interesting, there's an article in the Star um, in 1926 when the uh, trustees are appointed. So kind of when things really start to happen um, and kick off of planning for the museum. And they have quotes from um, business leaders and city leaders. And they there's a part of it that is a lot about um, everything that this will do for Kansas City. Like um, it'll spur economic development with people coming here, you know, to see the museum. It'll be a boon for the for the students educationally to have this. And um, so I think there, there's definitely, like John said, um, Jonathan said, two sides to the coin of boosterism and wanting to put Kansas City on the map, um, but also a little bit of like awareness of, of the East Coast and, right. and how they might be seen. Well, and maybe the, the well, clearly the, the Kansas City Museum is a, is a geographic outlier in this conversation, but it's no surprise or it's not an accident that the Nelson is where it is, the, the Liberty Memorial is where it is. The, again, this is the same time that JC Nichols is developing the plaza. So I think it's difficult for, I think maybe modern Kansas Cityans to recognize this, that that cultural area, 
was in fact, um, well, let's not pull any punches. It was ugly. Um, you know, we know that because early can you know Kansas City residents at the turn of the century used to write about how ugly their city was, right? The muddy streets and the you know it, it wasn't planned to the extent that they want. So all of the people we're talking about, all of the sort of energies going in, is you know it's not only going to be an economic engine. It's not only going to be a little bit of Kansas City Midwestern defensiveness, but it was also a um, I, I think Denise mentioned the City Beautiful movement, right? That this is a, a, at the time where we're, as Kansas Cityans, going to invest in making our city actually physically more attractive. Was that maybe Jonathan can speak to that? Like in the in the layout of the of the Liberty Memorial Complex, I mean, there's a certain architectural style there that's very classical that's we see reflected in the in the Nelson as well. But this, this, the aesthetics of both of your institutions, are, I think, are an important part of this story. Yeah, well, uh, with the, uh, you know, the Liberty Memorial, I mean, the, the, the overall plan was to have it as a, a cultural center up on this hill, Memorial Hill is what it, it is, the official name, and, and looking at, across at the Union Station, the Beaux-Arts Union Station, and, um, and the thinking was the city was it's growing to the south. My understanding was it was kind of developing toward the south, and then later things changed and it went to the north. But um, the, the architecture and everything, um, it, it was supposed to be a whole cultural center here, including an art museum and including the symphony hall and all these things. And um, that didn't happen for various reasons. And that actually not happening affected the history of the memorial. Uh, of course, as I showed the pictures, it was a big opening. It was a big deal for Kansas City. And um, it, uh, uh, everything about it and the, the money spent in the, in the architecture and everything about it was just done uh, with the highest aspirations. Um, and uh, it just, but nothing happened after that kind of things, well, history went on and things changed. So, um, um, but it was to be the center. And, and, and so that's a story in itself. Right. right. And in fact, the, um, like the Mary Atkins had passed away four years before um, William Rockhill Nelson and the trustees of her estate had gone, you know, that was where they were going to put it, was in that cultural center um, adjacent, you know, in that complex where the Liberty Memorial was going to be. And they had gone to the extent of having uh, plans drawn up. Um, but then it, that, that whole idea kind of, kind of fell through of having, of developing that. Um, and so then when Erwin Kirkwood offered the Opal site, um, that that's when, you know, it got built down there instead. But it is, it is just really interesting because something I was reading made it like um, that the Atkins Museum would have been like at the end of a mall from the Liberty Memorial. So that there you know, would have been a really strong connection if that had happened. And I think the original University of Kansas City was gonna be plotted over there as well. Uh, and again, all these things slightly changed. Well, maybe shifting topics just a little bit. And once again, to, for the audience members, if you have additional questions, please put them in the, I think I said the chat, please put them in the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. The, especially for the Kansas City Museum and maybe to a lesser extent for the Nelson, when you're creating the early collections, you're, you're in essence selecting stories to be told, right? You're selecting you know, the certain narratives to be representative. And in that process, you're also excluding some other stories. What do you know about the early histories of your institutions where some decisions were made that we might look back and think that selection process uh, tells us a little bit about the origins of these institutions? Hmm. Well, I can tell you in terms of the Kansas City Museum, they had a, a ready built collection. They didn't they didn't have individuals that went out searching. They had the Missouri Valley Historical Society collection, which was already made. They had the Dyer Museum or Kansas City Museum collection. They had the Dyer collection of, of Indian curios as it was called. And so they really were looking uh, within with what they had, with what they were, was a built-in collection for them and they really did open in 1940 with a complete hodgepodge of collections. There were 
items from brought back from the Orient. There was a lot of emphasis on uh, indigenous peoples. And I think now in looking back, uh, would anyone ever call a, a brand new grand exhibit Eskimo land? Uh, certainly not, <laughs> but uh, we had shrunken heads and um, basket mummies and we had a lot of exotic material that we very uh, earnestly uh, interpreted as part of world history and the history of humankind, I suppose. But we also had a full, uh, full scale bison in our front lobby and a complete skeletal form of a whale uh, in the museum. So we were really far ranging uh, world history, uh, the whole works. And it, it, there really wasn't a concerted effort to zero in on uh, people's, particular people's stories. It really was the story of mankind in their, in their thinking. Um, and I'm sure they didn't believe at the time that they were leaving anyone out, right, right. Uh, but of course, as we grew as an institution uh, over the decades, the more professional our uh, staff became, the more the inequities were noticed. And some were tried, you know, tried very diligently to, to try to <coughs> help. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, and thank you for that. I, and I'm going to piggyback on that with a question about the directors that, that each one of you mentioned. And there's a question in the Q&A. So the interesting um, Forbes who came out from Boston and, and Paul Gardner, the first director, obviously Harvard trained. And I know it's a, maybe a stretch, but any Boston connection between the two of them? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, there's a great biography of JRF and it would be not, I, it'd be good to go back to that and see if, if there is any uh, connection there. I don't know. Do you know, Tara? I don't know. Mm -mm. Um, another question from the Q and A, which, and I, I'll basically answer this because it's exactly the answer. The, the easy answer is what we think it is. So what caused the development of the Memorial Nelson Atkins University campus to fall through? Um, it, there was, um, there were grand plans um, and I'm not sure where I've seen those drawings. Maybe they're at the Kansas City Museum, but there's, um, there's, a, there's a rough uh, landscape plan um, about what this was gonna look like, basically now what we would call, you know, middle of Brookside uh, for what this complex would look like. Um, the university's original name was going to be, I believe, Lincoln and Lee. It was going to be a, uh, a joining of the North and the South. Uh, there would all be all these cultural um, institutions that surrounded. It was a grand plan. And like many grand plans, without adequate funding, it fell through. And so the result kind of happened in bits and pieces. Although, once again, these bits and pieces were in this remarkably um, sort of narrow scope of time. So um, I want to actually, before I leave this topic, get back and let have Tara have a chance to answer. What was the thought process behind the, the original collection in the Nelson? Mm -hmm. Well, the trustees very much wanted to have a collection that would represent um, cultures from across the world. Um, so they, Sent, you know, their, the agents went all over um, acquiring art. And that's, as Julian was saying earlier um, about an encyclopedic collection, that was very much part of our, our early um, collecting focus to, you know, um, art from all over the world. But um, at the same time, they did not really purchase um, actively collect art created by African-American artists or by women artists. Um, and it wasn't until um, 1942, we had a um, traveling exhibition of African-American artists, uh, African-American art. Um, and then um, it, uh, 
some are some works depicting um, African American subjects, but not by African American artists um, until I believe our first purchase was in 1993. Of, uh, of course, now we have. Um, the focus with um, current exhibition of uh, local African-American artists in testimony. Um, and that's an area of development, but um, that was not something that the early trustees were purchasing, or like I said, works from women artists. They did, interestingly, um, and this was sort of um, a new approach, um, include, they collected a good bit of, um, um, Native American um, art and artifacts as part of the part of the art collection. Um, in fact, um, a lot from the Fred Harvey Company here, with, so another Kansas City connection. Um, but that was that was the extent of it. Okay, Jonathan, you said other cities were interested, obviously, in uh, in a World War One memorial. Did other communities go through with it? Do we know, are there other cities that have built similar structures or when, when Kansas City got the lead, did, did that become the national story? Um, well, I know in Indianapolis, there's a pretty big memorial and it has, if I have it right, it, it has a museum within it and it dates from World War I. Uh, and in St. Louis, there's a museum that just reopened a couple of years ago. There are uh, what was called the Soldiers and Sailors Museum, and that was dedicated to those served in World War in the World War World War One, um, and uh, you know so that happened. But that was about ten years. That opened like ten years after uh, Liberty Memorial did. So that was in the thirties. Um, I don't. There's there are memorials everywhere, but uh, World War One even in the even in the city even even on our grounds. There's a, actually another World War One memorial. Uh, but I think uh, ours is ours is the largest and the just the most um, comprehensive and everything. And obviously, in terms of our museum, it's the only one. It's the only uh, World War One museum. So, um, and I just want to make a point real quick in a few seconds. Uh, our collection of our collections, our collection uh, was 100 years old last year. It started in 1920 with posters. And I showed one of the posters, uh, and it wasn't just about America's part in the war. It was. All the countries involved so it wasn't just a just american centric u.s centric it was all the wars and that's how it is today it's everybody uh, all the participants um, are represented let me go to one final q a one final q a question uh and this is for denise uh someone mentioned that um she was a frequent visitor to the kansas city museum and at the time there was a room with a number of stuffed animals preserved animals uh do you know what happened to those the Natural History Hall uh, was opened in the 60s, late 50s, early 60s. And we had a real concentration on taxidermied animals. Uh, Art Popham was our benefactor in that. Those animals began to be deaccessioned in the early 90s. We found homes for them at uh, KU's Natural History Museum. And then in the late, no, early, mid to, mid to late two, two, or 2000s, the rest of the collection, the collection that had been on display for at least 20 years, went off to new homes uh, in the region, one to Hayes, Kansas, uh, some to uh, a museum in uh, Springfield, Missouri. So they all found um, as long as they new found homes. new comfortable homes. That's that's how we wanted to know. They all right. found new homes. Right. Uh, so it was just it was time for us to put away that aspect of uh, of our history and move on. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Um, Tara, as we close, do you want to give one more plug for the the exhibit? Sure, thanks. Um, please do come out and check out Origins Collecting to Create the Nelson Atkins. Like I said, it's on view um, through March 6th, and you can actually visit uh, two other exhibitions at the same time, um, Weaving Splendor uh, about Asian textiles and castles, cottages, and crime. Um, but please do come out and see Origins. Um, I'm really excited to have been a part of it because we were able to incorporate a lot of archival documents into it as well. 
alongside the art. So it's a great chance to see some of those materials that don't um, get shown very often either. So hope, hope to see you in the, in the gallery soon. Thank you. Sounds terrific. Well, thanks to our, our, our presenters, Denise, Tara, and Jonathan. And thank you for joining us tonight on this interesting conversation about what was going on in Kansas City in this particularly heady time. Thank you very much.